This is the second video in a short series that's dedicated to sort of the foundation of the exponential function uh, e to the x that we know and love. So in the first video, what we did was we showed that there exists a function that we named capital E, whose domain is real numbers and whose, uh, whose codomain is the real numbers, such that this capital E had the following two properties. Uh, the first one says that capital E is its own derivative for every single x and r, and the second property says that uh, its y-intercept is one. So if you've seen maybe some like differential equations, um, you might recognize this as uh, we're trying to say that, um, you know, the exponential function we know and love is the solution to some initial value problem. And we know that that solution that we get is unique. And so what we're gonna try to do is, is pretty much prove that result. We're gonna try to show that this function E that satisfies these two properties here um, is unique. So typically how you do a uniqueness proof to show a function's unique, let's say you had two of them. And what we're gonna try to do is a whole bunch of work to show that E1 and E2 are in fact the same. So let's suppose that E1 and E2 are two functions that satisfy these two conditions one and two above right here. So what we'll do is, another typical thing in a uniqueness proof, is to define a new function that's the difference of the two. And what we're going to aim to show here is I could show that these two are equal if I could show that this function f is zero. So that's what we're going for. And so let's think about, well, if f is the difference of these two functions, and if those two functions have all of these cool properties, I bet their difference does too. So notice when you differentiate capital F, well, that's just the derivative of each thing and the difference here. And of course, well, that's E1 and that's E2 by property one up here, right? E1 is its own derivative and so is E2. And so F prime is just the same thing as, hey, that's what we defined F to be. So F prime is just F. So actually F satisfies number one up here. That's pretty cool. And you probably already see what happens when we plug zero into F. When I plug zero into F, well by definition, plug it into E1 and plug zero into E2 and subtract. But uh, E1 of zero, well E1 was supposed to satisfy number two, so that's one. So this is one. And similarly, E2 of zero has to be one. So in fact, F of zero is going to be zero. Okay. So what are some other things we want to notice about this function? Well, uh, that the nth derivative, remember that's the notation for nth derivative, that that exists for every natural number. In other words, you could differentiate this function as many times as you want. Again, and it because, it's because of this property up here that, uh, that we've assumed e1 and e2 are their own derivatives. Uh, therefore, like the 58th derivative of e1 is still e1. You could show that by induction, say. 58 was just a goofy number that I picked. In particular, though, so the, it holds for the difference, too. So the nth derivative of f is equal to just f for every natural number. You take whatever derivative you want, it still goes back f. So what we're going to do now is, if I have all this fantastic information about capital F, let's think about Taylor's formula and Taylor's theorem. So let's let x be any real number. x is arbitrary. And let's say that i is just a closed interval that has endpoints 0 and x. So uh, I'm not trying to say that 0 is the left endpoint and x is the right endpoint. Maybe they're switched. I'm just saying i is the interval that has those two things as its endpoint. I don't care what side of 0 x is on. So now what we're going to do is apply Taylor's theorem. So what did Taylor's theorem tell me about such a function f on this interval from uh, that has 0 and x as its endpoints? Well, it told me that for each natural number, there should be a point in that interval, call it cn, such that more or less the function is equal to the Taylor polynomial where kind of this m piece, this remainder piece, uh, it's kind of like a fudge factor is another way to think about it. Anyway, I could make this equality here. Uh, I'm always guaranteed to make that equality. I don't know exactly what cn is, but Taylor's theorem tells me that it exists. So in particular, right, the function f of x uh, is equal to this sort of Taylor polynomial that you could see is centered at zero, if you've heard that uh, terminology before, and then plus that term at the very end here where it's evaluated at Cn. Now let's think about what do I know about each of these pieces here. Uh, I know that f of zero is equal to zero, and since f is the same thing as all the derivatives of f, everything I've highlighted down here on the bottom is all zero. And that's pretty cool because that just leaves me with the end piece, right? Kind of that remainder term. So the nth derivative evaluated at that cn that existed due to Taylor's theorem uh, over n factorial times x to the nth power here. So I've got my function f is equal to this expression right here. Now let's think about what is some other stuff that we know about n. Um, oh, by the way, what did I do there? Oh, uh, what did I do there? Well, the nth derivative of f is just the function f itself. So I'll rewrite it that way. So that's all that equality is to show. 
Now, what are some other things we know about f? Well, f's continuous on this interval i, and i is this cool closed bounded interval. We know continuous functions are awesome on closed bounded intervals. So therefore, one awesome property of continuous functions on closed bounded intervals is that the function f itself is bounded on this interval i. Therefore, there should exist some constant k, some just real number k, such that uh, the absolute value of f never gets larger than k as long as I stay in this interval i. So in particular, let's apply that. Let's think about what's going on here. If I apply that, uh, that idea. So if I take the absolute value of f of x, where x is in my interval i, that's the same thing as the absolute value of this right here, right? We just showed that these two things are equal. And now, what do I know? I know that f of cn, I know the absolute value of f of cn, like it's not arbitrarily large. I know that it's less than or equal to this number k. Uh, and so in particular, all of this together is less than that number k over n factorial times that stuff there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to notice that, well, that holds for every natural number, right? So for this k, this will work for every natural number. So let's take the limit. When I write limit here, I'm kind of doing the same convention as Bartle and Gerbert, where its limit is n goes to infinity. And I know that this factorial is going to win out over this exponential. And how do I know that? Keep in mind, right, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. So in particular, that x right now is fixed, and this k is a constant. And uh, so in that case, again, this factorial, n factorial, gets big way faster than absolute value of x to the nth power. So that's zero. So think about what this says now. Uh, this says that the absolute value of f of x is always less than or equal to this. But we just showed that the limit of that is zero. So it gets arbitrarily small as x gets large. Therefore, f of x itself has to be zero. Well, since x was arbitrary, that says that the function f is identically zero. So remember, that's the notation to say that a function is equal to zero, right? It's the horizontal line that's the, uh, that's the x-axis. It's the same thing as the equation y equals zero. So that's f. Well, that's pretty cool because f, f was e1 minus e2, and of course, that tells me that e1 is equal to e2. So what we've just done is we've just showed that e is the unique function. We just showed that, well, if there were two, surprise, it's still just one. So there's only one such function that satisfies, again, these two properties right here.